My name is Phoebe Dubar, also known as IKSRE. I'm a vocalist, viola player, music producer, certified practicing sound healer and card-carrying audiophile who experiences the world through her ears. And over the coming weeks, we're diving deep into the topic closest to my heart, sound. What is it and why it makes us feel the way that it does? We'll speak to experts and I'll even treat you to a few sound healing practices along the way. Welcome to What is Sound? Recorded on the stolen lands of the Bunurong and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. Always was, always will be. Inspiration is found everywhere if you look hard enough. Riza. Wu Tang Clan. So this week I thought we would take a totally different journey into the question that I've been asking everyone. And so I hit up someone who I knew would have a lot to say on the topic with a really interesting slant. He's a musician, producer, and recording engineer who's worked with some of the biggest names in the business. Hello, Bieber, Wu-Tang, and Flume. And was also responsible for recording the sound bath track on my album, Awake Within the Dream. He owns the stunning Ginger Studios in Northcote, where we happen to be recording today. And he happens to be a complete legend as well. Please introduce yourself to the listeners of What Is Sound. Uh, So I'm the owner and operator of Ginger Recording Studios. I've had the studio for around about... Well, no, actually, like, go back a long way, it was called something else. Mm. It was originally, I called it Deaf Teddy Studios, and I meant <laughs> deaf as in the word D-E-A-F. When I was in high school and I had a music practice room, mm. my mum gave me this teddy bear that had like a, you know, just like as a joke, you hang it on the door handle around the outside of the door that was like a high, you know, warning high decibel zone. Oh, yeah. And it was like just hanging on the door. I was like, I named the studio after that bear because, I, you know, after that many years of of listening to me poorly playing music, it would either want to be deaf or just be deaf. <laughs> and so so that was what it was originally called. And there's this like cutout from when I got my console delivered that actually still says Deaf Teddy on it because that was the only name that I had to order the original, con- like the console for the studio with. That was in 2003 that I started that, like at the end of high school when I went off to music uni. Uh, I worked out how to, you know, make money out of having a studio uh, and then from that, I started Ginger because I needed a more grown up and intelligent name than mm. like a deaf teddy bear. That was kind of dumb. Um, and that's, Are you speaking to someone who's named herself? I keep seeing rainbows everywhere. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what it stands for. Didn't you know that? No, I had no idea. <laughs> so good. I don't think today. you've even uh, said your name. What is your no, name? No. Who is this Sorry. voice? <laughs> I, I, I am James Lloyd Wyatt uh, and I've. I've been here, yeah. I guess Ginger started in 2010 when I really mm-hmm. set my mind to building a high-end studio. Before that, the the other one that I had at home, it was like a – at the time, and, and funnily enough, I guess that's what 20 years does for you, is uh, what I was working with then was seen as very much a non – like an, an unprofessional um, – recording studio Mm. it was an interface and a pair of speakers and some microphones Mm -hmm. nowadays that is Mm. like you can make world-class stuff off that exactly i suppose if you put your mind to it you can do that off anything but that was not the epitome of what studios were people were still going to big studios Mm. and doing it that way and and recording to tape still no uh, the first job I had in the industry, yes, was still to tape. Um, mm. That was in 2009, 2010. I was working for a guy called Jonathan Burnside who did uh, the Sleepy Jackson. Mm. He did uh, Dallas Crane, Grin Spoons, Easy. And that studio that I worked for had both Pro Tools and a tape machine. It was an MCI tape machine and he had a Studer A800 and an MCI console. And it was like, it was cool the console was very temperamental mm. and it had some things about it that I would never wish upon any other engineer. That tripped me up a few times. Like you turn phantom power on, which is, you know, for anyone that doesn't know that listens to your podcast, it's something that you provide as power to a microphone that needs, has active circuitry in it. And by turning that on, it the microphone works. 
certain microphones, it's not good if you have that turned on and you patch them in and out, like ribbon microphones and some mm. dynamic microphones. And that console was dangerous because if it, the way you turn Phantom Power on is you pushed the gain pot for the mic pre in. Like you just mm. tapped it and it would turn on, which meant that it was so easy to accidentally yeah. do. Like if you go, I'm just going to add like a little bit because the kick drum's not loud enough and you just went to reach for it, you could accidentally just turn it on and not know you'd done it. So I was working for him and I, I kind of realised that there wasn't a space like the ones that I'd seen in magazines and on the internet at the mm. time. You know, <clears throat> it was still somewhat in its infancy in 2010 for the way that we're used to using it now and the places that I was looking at and then it was fortunate enough to go um, – they were just worlds above what that studio was. It was cool. It was like an old 70s mm. kind of place. It's where I met Nick Huggins who was uh, under Two Bright Lakes. He's fantastic. You should check out his mm. music. Your listeners probably would love what he does. I just know him as the guy ultimately though who had the studio next to the one that I was in at Jonathan's place. So he mm. was under Jonathan as well at, at um, Eastern Block, B-L-O-C it was called. Mm. Um, but that was the studio where they did the Nick Cave, Kali Minogue murder ballads. Oh, wow. Yeah. So <clears throat> a cool 70s kind of vibe, very dark, yeah. very dingy. Not the way I like a studio to be like this one is here. No. Anyway, fast forward from that, I decided that I could do what he was doing better in a way that felt more like the way I wanted it to be. Not mm. just better because he was a very good engineer and very liberal with his information. Um, and then – I set about finding property, finding investment, finding equipment to fill it with and then put together the studio that was in Richmond um, and I was there for just on 10 years. And with that, I built the studio that we're in now and the house that's here. And the whole thing has kind of come together and was a discussion between my wife and I about what we wanted to cultivate for a uh, my business and for our lives, which mm. was for the studio to be a part of that and to have creatives coming into our space. And hence, you know, you see the garden now and it was the thing that you kind of mentioned on your way in. Mm, looks unreal. It, it's totally different. <clears throat> is it's, it's all natives. It'll grow up to be a, a, a much, you mm. know, more inviting space because they're young, tiny little plants at the moment. Yeah. They're, they're not established. Mm. And I guess in some ways it's a bit like the studio. It's an... It, it's, mm. it's an uh, an analogy for the studio as well because it's re-establishing its roots again yeah, nice. and coming here. And funny, you, like, you know, we mentioned at the beginning the, some of the people that I've worked with, the studio now I'm looking more to focus on the things that got me into the industry, which mm. is smaller artists, uh, independents preferably and not exclusively, but I love working with an artist at the beginning of their journey, at the yeah. start of making a rec their recording history where – I can affect real positive change for them and having a great first experience. Mm. Now, one of the things that happened at my old studio a lot was I'd get people on maybe their second record and there would be some stories of like, oh, I worked here and it wasn't that great or the engineer was a bit of a mm, and it wasn't that much fun and mm. I never wanted people to have that experience. Mm. And so by being here, it's more accessible to do that because I don't have to fund a commercial property any longer. I don't mm. have to, you know, it's a home studio. Um I don't have to pay the crazy overheads mm. that are associated with commercial property. And so I can focus more on art and more on experience, which is the thing that got me into doing it and that I love. Amazing. Amazing. It's such a beautiful space. Thanks. It's just unreal. It's absolutely gorgeous in here. So congrats. Thanks. It's, we're congrats. really happy with where it's gotten to. Yeah, you should be. Yeah. So. So the question that I ask everybody is kind of the first main question, which I love hearing everyone's different answers to this. I really want to hear your answer is mm. quite simple. What is sound? Uh, okay. <laughs> so from a technical perspective, it is the vibration of atoms as rare fractions and compressions move through them to transport a message from one place to another. I suppose that's it at a, at a mm. technical level. Yeah, absolutely. And then from that, you can take an emotional perspective as well, mm. which is it is the resonation of I don't know if that's the word. Mm. It's the resonating of one's resonating, yeah, of of one's internal self in sympathy to the expression of another's. That's unreal. Which might be better. So, <laughs> and, and 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 that makes sense from what I do with my job. Is there mm. is both. In one hand, the technical side of it, and in the other hand, there is the very, 
very emotional side of what we do, mm, which absolutely. is is to you know help people um, give their message across. But the technical side is super important because a poor recording could spoil that message. Mm-hmm. You know, you could overdo the distortion on something and and spoil the tone, or you mm. and 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 you could cook it. Like and it'd be really bad, and then that sort of sad song might not be so sad. It might be kind of angry now, mm. which could be good, but also could be bad. So yeah, you have to have both. It's the yin and the yang. And it also comes down to a lot of what I do. With, I've just come off running a workshop, um, training people how to use uh, bowls and and mantra. And one thing that I really try and get across to them is it's about the intent. What are you trying to? What are you yeah. trying to convey? So exactly, your job as engineer is to make sure that the the way that you're recording it is actually getting the right intent across. So like, it's supposed to be a sad song. Oops, I've done too much. Um, you know, distortion. So yeah. now it's an angry song. Yeah. And it's like that wasn't the intent. It might sound cool and you might be like, yeah, this sounds sick. This will be a hit. And the person's like, yeah, but it's not what, what my intention was. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and you have to be sympathetic to that mm. and to what people are trying to say before you work out how to make it. So the psychology of working with an artist, that's a huge part of it, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was certainly born with the gift of the gap. And so my favourite thing is to hear somebody's story. It's uncommon for me to talk on things like this because most of the time I like to listen. Mm. My father very much instilled in me the idea that you have two ears and one mouth and you should use them in that ratio. Someone else actually brought up that exact point. In fact, I think it was Lionel that I was telling you about in that first interview. Yeah, that was brought up. So it's the second time that's come up. Yeah, and Mm. it makes sense. Well, it allows you to to fulfil a support role, which is ultimately what being in a studio is. You are supporting other people. Mm. It's it's service-based industry, really. And, you know, I worked in hospitality for a long time before I did the music thing. Well, at the same time, because I... We had to pay for mm-hmm. a lot of, yeah. of the lifestyle that I was trying to live. Surprise, and surprise. Most musicians don't make money. <laughs> I make a ripper latte. Like I really <laughs> do. It's it's there. Um, I was really good at running events. <laughs> oh, cool. There you go. Right? Like, But it's all good training for what happens later. Exactly. Like, and, and the mm-hmm. fact that the coffee skills that I had actually got me my first job at Jonathan Burnside's studio because he was a, a customer there. And we were just talking because I like talking and he was waiting. And and so by talking to him a lot, I was able to uh, get myself in the door in studios. And that's how I came to be in, in the music industry was by just having a chat to this guy. And going back to talking to artists, I became quite focused on listening to what people had to say and why they were saying it. Not just mm. what, but very much why. Mm. You know, asking sort of slightly probing questions without trying to step on toes too much and you have to be responsive. Like, you, you know, if someone's, you know, if it's a party song, you don't really have to worry too much about what question you ask. And it's mm. fairly obvious and the, the conversation is going to go a certain way. But you can tell certain love songs, and I'm using inverted commas so that for everyone listening, <laughs> and you can't see me waving my hands madly, <laughs> is... Uh, that 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 love song may be a, a pain point for somebody because mm. it it's <clears throat> likely that it's something that's passed, or it's maybe not even about love. It just it it's I love a, I love a song that poses as a love or you know has the shield of a love song, but it's really not. Yeah, totally. Um, and and there's often a, a sore point there, and you need to be able to ask questions in a way that doesn't make somebody feel uncomfortable, and they want to open up to you and talk to you about it. Because it allows you to do your job better for them. Mm. And get the best performance out of them as well too. Totally. Do, it's to make- pointless if they're in there just, you know, um, singing the same vocal over and over and over again. I'm harking back to personal experience and you've just almost lost interest and you're just thinking yeah. about the technical. It's like, no, no, you have to – you as the engineer or the producer is is trying to get that best performance and to try to pull out that, that emotion because it's all very well if somebody's singing the – best notes and they're technically perfect and brilliant but if they're not communicating a message it just won't land with people yeah and that's that's usually because they don't feel safe to do it yeah because they they don't feel comfortable to be vulnerable yeah in a space or a situation and you know most of the time you can get a vocal i generally find in two to three takes with some punch-ins that usually is sort of about the numbers for me at the moment and that's Mm. It's great. But that might take four hours because mm. 
two of those hours we will spend talking mm. and just getting comfortable, especially if it's an artist that I haven't worked with before. And then things start to pick up and go faster and then it's about the arrangement if there's covered in you know harmonies and stuff like that. But the leads generally sort of take that long. And I don't mind it taking that long. In fact, it's better if it does. Yeah. As long as we're not singing for three hours because that's usually when people's voices conk out and it doesn't go so well then. Exactly. Unless you want that and here I am making everything okay either which way. No, that that is brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, so on that, um, in terms of your background in music and music production, you kind of mm-hmm. covered a bit of that off in terms of, you know, how Ginger Studios started, but in terms of you as a musician, like mm. how did you come to, you know, being an engineer slash producer rather than necessarily just being a musician? Like, well, It was a really simple process. Mm. I had a guitar teacher, a guy called Matt Creedon, who's out in the sort of eastern suburbs. He's in Baldwin. And he, being a great guitar teacher, I, I, I said to him, like, you know, I kind of idolized the guy. I thought he was great. And he went to Box Hill Institute as a, a, a guitar student. But what occurred is before I went to do an audition, I, I said to my guitar teacher, hey, Matt, I'm going to go off and do a, an audition for Box Hill as a gu- guitar you know, student. And he's like, no, you're not. I'm like, what? He goes, you are not good enough. (laughs) And this guy had been teaching me for flat out seven years. At Mm. that point, six or seven years he'd been teaching me for. Yeah, all of high school Mm. he'd had me. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you're just not good enough. You don't work hard enough at being a a guitarist. You don't don't know enough of the theory because you don't apply yourself to it. But what you really like is sound. Mm. What you really like is the... Uh, the nuts and bolts of music, the emotional side of it. He's like, you should go and do music production at Box Hill. Wow, what a legend. Yeah, totally. And initially I was like, you dick. Yeah, totally. Because <laughs> how old are you? 17, 18 or something? <clears throat> I was 18, yeah. Yeah, you would have been so furious. Oh, heartbroken. Yeah. I was like, oh, my God, the guy that I've been looking up to for yeah. the last six years has just told me that, like, I suck. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, and, you know, very appropriately, he, I mean, and he told me the, the truth. It was, he was right. And I still wouldn't be good enough to get into Box Hill as a guitarist. <laughs> like, I just wouldn't. It's not where your interests lie. That's the thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And also, like, you know, like last year I slashed my finger open with a whippersnipper and, like, now I couldn't be a guitarist <laughs> either at Box Hill. You know, I cut one of the tendons down to 50% left and it was, yeah. Yeah, whoops. Whoops. <laughs> but so, you know, I have this other skill because I can still run a fader with that, with that yeah, hand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or coil a mic cable. <laughs> Um, that is unreal. Isn't it wonderful when people actually see something in you that you can't see for yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when they're honest about it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And they're like, this will work. And it was really important um, for me then. And it set everything else up. That was, yeah, 2002. Uh, no, 2003 he would have said that because 2004 I went to Box Hill mm-hmm. as a, a sound production student. I forget what they called it. It was a Bachelor of Applied Music in Sound production i think Mm -hmm. it's a good course and it was it really gave me a start in understanding the areas of of the music industry and and of of sound uh but like all of these things you learn so much more once you're in the industry than you ever will in a course like yeah that that'll never give you enough no 100 percent. half of the things like i'll find myself um you know doing things in ableton and producing things and thinking, I swear half of this came into my head just from watching, you know, working with Ben or working with Ryan or working with all the different producers I've worked with over the years on other projects. You just think how much do you soak up from being the vocalist and sitting behind the producer watching them doing it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and also on that, like I was not a great guitarist, but I was a better drummer and I play drums mostly with with other artists if they're in here I, I I do a lot of drums for people and mm. the thing that I noticed was that drummers often make the most producers and and what I mean by that is drummers become producers a lot of the time mm. because they turn up to sessions early mm. they're there first they finish first and then they sit around and if they're not getting high they're watching and no one has budget or nor time to get high in a studio <laughs> anymore and so that often drummers end up becoming producers because they see the whole thing get put together Mm. around what they will start generally. 
And maybe because there's so much variation in what they do, for example, like the amount of different sounds within a drum kit totally. and how they can all be recorded or mixed or produced. There's yeah. just so much. It's endless. It's yeah. literally endless. I don't know that it's similar with, you know, a synth or a guitar with guitar pedals or something, but there is, there's, there's so, yeah. I remember hearing, um, uh, Tame Impala, um, Kevin talking about the production of the drums on, I think it was the second Tame Impala album and saying like Int- just the yeah. drums alone took two years or something crazy like that just to do the drums. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. And it's I think it's all three mics as well. It's like kick, <laughs> snare and an overhead. And it's Amazing. A mono. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and I, it's partly because drums are full frequency. You know, you've got everything from super low subby stuff all the way up to like frequencies that, that human beings can't hear that come out of a cymbal. Yeah. Right? Like so That's it's it. it's full frequency. It goes the whole way and beyond. Yeah. Um you know, a piano is the other instrument that would get close. Yeah, it's true. And Very true. both in the percussion family. Mm. You know? Very true. So a- kids go orchestra. become a percussionist. Yeah, become a, <laughs> be, be a pianist and then a percussionist. Yeah. Yeah, and you get to do the cool stuff like who doesn't want to play an anvil in in an orchestra? <laughs> I, you know, ordinarily a tool of the of the blacksmith, also repurposed as, you know, an what orchestral symphony? instrument. What symphony? What symphony? Is it a Mahler that has has the anvils? Yeah, there are a few that have cannons offside of stage. Amazing. But I was yeah very much a percussionist. You know, like kettle drums, that kind of you know mm. timpani is they're better known as and um, triangles, things like that. And you can be a kind of relative. You can be a less trained musician and get to play in an orchestra as a percussionist in comparison to say a uh you know you have to have a i think a higher level of training to be of you know a string player in an orchestra than you do a percussionist like if you're starting late in life go for percussion go for percussion <laughs> yeah because there are, there's there's unpitched instruments that you get to play yeah right and so there's there's a, a lower barrier to entry hmm. which is cool hmm. And you get to play a whole bunch of cool stuff. Yeah, you get to play all the fun, <laughs> the loud stuff. Yeah, like no it. one can turn you down. That's it. Yeah. That's it. It was funny. I was saying to someone um, only yesterday about gong and how how gong can be really um, uh, divisive with people in sound baths because it really yeah. affects a lot of people um, once they're in that parasympathetic state and. Um, I was saying, they were saying, oh, I really like the way that I, because I very much underplay the gong because I'm conscious of people, some people being sure. really sensitive to it. And um, I was saying, yeah, if if you're the kind of person that, you know, wants to play gong loudly, go and join an orchestra. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> don't 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 become don't do it in sound. Go and um, go and join an orchestra. But um, so in terms of sound, like actually, it's a <clears throat> get on to the next question. How do you like? How do you experience sound? Like. S- I always wanted to be synesthetic, but yeah, I'm not. Yeah, me too. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I really wish. <laughs> yeah. I, I do not want for perfect pitch. I mm. don't because you lose it and mm. everyone that has it loses it. Uh, I always wanted to be synesthetic though, like to be able to like hear sound as colour, like, you know, mm. play a C and see blue or pink or whatever it is that some, some people do. Um, but to me, I think I experience sound as emotional like relativity so it's something in relation to something else Mm. you know it and and sound has no future and only a past because you can only play a note in in relation to another either at the same time Mm. or later Mm. you you can't play the next note before you hear it just doesn't work like that Mm. like it can't arrive at the listener early unless technically you're underwater because then it travels that at a different true. speed, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then maybe, but but, but uh, generally speaking, yes, yeah, sound only has a past, and so it's about um, an emotion is something through sound that you experience from something happening now in relation to something that happened before. So mm. it's a historical thing as well. It like mm. it's all it's all about a, a history of what came before, and the way that I experience it ultimately is as emotion and, and, and and whether a sadness is created or an excitement or a, uh, a, a a dissonance and therefore an uncomfortable situation. It's generally how I experience it as attitude, as yeah, as emotion. Yeah. That would be it. Unreal. Absolutely love it. It's totally off topic, but I had a note to remind Mm. you to 
tell tell the listeners about your story about working with Wu Tang. <laughs> I woke up really hungover one day um, uh, and and got a phone call from because I, I don't drink anymore, but I did then. Um, I, I got a phone call from this guy who was polite but relatively short on the telephone and he said, oh, look, you know, I'm looking for a studio tonight. Um, it's me and a couple guys. And I was like, oh, it's going to be another f- hip-hop thing. Like, so is this when you're in Richmond? Yeah, this is yeah. in the Richmond studio. I'm like, this, I couldn't be bothered with people, but I was like, cool, what I'll do a set. Because he said tonight and so I'm like, I'll be fine by then. I'm like, yeah, cool, you can come <laughs> in and blah, 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 the studio's like this and, you know, he asked me some interesting questions. He's like, you know, where can I get some broccoli? And I'm like, what? I'm like, broccoli. I'm like, oh, broccoli. I get it. Like, oh, he's yes. talking about, you know, the, the green, oh, the green things. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I'm like, oh, look, man, you can do whatever you want, but you have to do it in the alley out the back and you'll have to, um, like you, yeah, you can't do it inside. He's like, oh, why not? I'm like, well, it's a $2,500 cleaning fee. He's like, that's a good reason to smoke outside. And I like, <laughs> so I'm talking to this guy and I said to him, like, okay, so, you know, uh, who, who do I address the invoice to? He's like, oh, you can send it to me, Bobby Diggs. And I'm like, who the hell is Bobby Diggs? Mm. Like, what a name. This is a joke. And it's cool. Know? Yeah, this is a joke. And I'm like, what's the email address? He's like, oh, me is a RZA, R-Z-A at Woo Music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I just like was kind of rude on the phone to RZA. <laughs> you know? That is so rude. I had no idea. I anyway, then it. he comes and and they're at the studio and they were there for ages. They they mm. started at five and they finished at four thirty the next morning. Mm. And they went to a radio show that like straight after they'd been in the studio. Wow. But you know, as each new member from the Wu Tang Clan would turn up at the time, Rizzo was really he was not so on the level. He was like. Mm. You know, as people walk in, he's like, everyone, there's some rules. Archie, who's the dog that was at the studio, still is. He's, yeah. he's still kicking now. He's 13. He's like, Archie's a friend, you know, <laughs> and you've got to smoke outside. And so <laughs> Rizza actively sent every single member of the Wu-Tang Clan that wanted to spliff into the alley to smoke. So, like, like the biggest, baddest that kind of guys in the, in, in the music industry are, like, getting sent into the alley like they're naughty little boys to have a I spliff. I love that so much. So for a complete noob, like how, how does recording, how does one capture sound? I know this is like a huge question, so let's try and limit it to yeah. five minutes. I mean, let's start by just saying that recording sound is an aberration of sound. Mm. It is not the way that human beings were designed to listen to it. It's not the way that we were designed to experience it. And probably why I defaulted to a drummer in the end, because there's like the gorilla in me wants to sit behind a thing that's loud enough that it gives me physical feedback at Mm. the time. Sound to be recorded generally starts with uh, the creation of that sound through an instrument or uh, slapping together of two pieces of like two inanimate objects. Uh, And and that creates pressure waves that move through air and ideally into a microphone, which converts it into an electrical, uh, you know, stimulus. Um, and then that travels down a wire to another piece of equipment that would be a microphone preamplifier where it's brought up to a level that is loud enough that a, a, a recording medium can, uh, you know, capture that accurately. And that could be through either a tape machine if you want the pain and suffrage of a tape machine <laughs> or into a digital audio workstation if you're okay with that side of it as well. And everything has a limitation. And then from there it has to be reinterpreted from its electrical state of being stored and then played back out through a speaker. And so that's really, I guess, how we experience it in a studio. And my job ultimately – tends to start, because I did so much jazz and so much classical stuff in the early, particularly jazz, mm. working with purists in, in the nicest possible way. The people mm. were really, really particular and, you know, about how their thing came out and sounded, mm. um, being as close to what they experienced at the, at the playing position. Um, but it's pretty impossible to actually do that. That's the thing. It is. And, com- and your interpretation of their experience is completely different. Mm. That's the thing. Yeah. And th- th- that's why there's always a discussion after you start doing something being like, mm. how close is this to where you want it to mm. be? Knowing that it will never be exactly the same 
and and maybe it's best if you have a desired goal and you're okay about being flexible with it because mm-hmm. you're going to need to be. Um, you know, say a, a drummer, you know, putting a pair of microphones six feet above a drum kit, no one ever has their head there. No. But it's just standard practice. Mm-hmm. You know, the, a good place to start would be to put a like a binaural microphone like on the drummer. If you Like wearing binaural um uh, mics would work, but drummers tend to move their heads a lot when they're playing. Yeah. And so it, you would always be changing the picture. So you can't have that. You know, that mm. would be a further aberration of sound mm. in some ways because from a listener's perspective, it would be distracting and that would make you feel sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It would suck. Um, and so, but, but a microphone is a really imperfect device and it, lots of limitations, lots of mm. things about it that make it not work so well. And then that coupled with, a pre-amplifier that will color the sound and change the sonic profile of it mm. before it then enters a digital audio workstation or a tape machine. And a tape machine will color it even further than uh, a DAW or digital audio workstation will. And then it has to go out through an amplifier after it's played back mm. and then through a set of speakers. And those are two more things that will change the sound. And now you're relying on the second room that you're listening to the original recording that was played in a different room you're trying to interpret in that Mm. space again as to how accurately it is being reproduced knowing what you know about the room that you're listening to it in changing it again it goes through so many filters doesn't it and different versions and going back to the the mention of you know a preamp for example and all that coloring things for example that's why for example you know so many people get so caught up on oh i love this microphone preamp because it gives us this sound or this sound and then that's just one piece of the puzzle there's so many different types of each level of this gear that you can get that's going to change it slightly it's just the combinations are literally infinite. Yeah. Well, and- I, I often used to teach at, at um, Box Hill when I was there that that you need to work out what is going to make the biggest change mm. rather than focus so much on the gear. And early days I was so focused on the gear. I, oh, I really loved it. Like, yeah. And it's because it's toys. Yeah. I, I was going to say any 18-year-old guy would just be like, woohoo, all this fun stuff to play with. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, toys. They're mm. just, you know, and – because I'm not a, it's not cool anymore for me to play with like Pokemon at, at 37. <laughs> Although I don't know, maybe it is, but but it is okay for me to play with a synthesizer and with drumsticks and a, a bunch of of audio gear. Mm-hmm. But the thing that I used to impress upon people a lot was you'll make more of a change by moving a microphone two inches than you ever will changing the preamp. Wow! You, it just it you can't change it nearly as much by altering the physical space Mm. as much as you can. uh, Sorry, changing the physical locations of things will alter it more than you can ever do with a preamp unless you're driving it into crazy distortion levels and then that's another thing. Yeah. But but generally speaking, if like for the amount of change, like, yeah, it's way more to move a mic than it is to. And and, and then next would be to swap the microphone. Hmm. You can actually it, it works better if to, if you think about it in the order of the chain the way that it goes through that's a, a level of decrease like diminishing value. That's true. Of yeah, return. the first the first point is the microphone. <clears throat> well, the first point really is the thing that's making the sound, which is the person. Yeah, so make true. them feel bad and they'll play shit. Yeah. <laughs> make them feel great and they'll play better. Um, <clears throat> give them a different instrument and it will sound different. Hmm. Give, change where the microphone is located and it will sound different. Change hmm. the microphone and then it will sound different, but not as much. Then <clears throat> change the mic preamp and it will sound different, but not as much. Change the converter and it hmm. will sound different, but not as much. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's on the way in. And it's interesting you saying again about being an aberration and it and it was, again, it was something that came up the other day. Someone asked me, they said, oh, do you ever um, bring your viola to sound baths? And I said no because the way that I use viola in my music is layered and textural and um, for me to do that in a sound bath would mean me bringing in a speaker, my looping pedal or computer in Ableton but I'd probably just bring my looping pedal. And then it basically becomes it's, – it's a recorded version, 
Whereas uh-huh. everything else in my sound bath, as you would know from recording yourself, is an acoustic instrument. Yeah, it's all the live. only thing is that I use field recordings when I'm at a yoga studio and play them um, because I'm yet to be able to um, impersonate birds. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you. Life goals. Yeah, but I love the fact that a sound bath, for example, is all acoustic instruments. I'm playing something and people are experiencing it directly. Yeah, sure. That instrument in the yeah. moment, in front, there's no amplification, there's nothing. But if I was to introduce viola and looped viola, that is essentially a recording of the viola that's being that's being looped over and played. Yeah. And it just it changes it completely. I, of course, do viola for my when I play my music live, but that's different because it's amplified vocals and viola and synths and stuff. It's a totally different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I love the fact that we – with um yeah with the sound bath it is all it's acoustic and also I love the um the uh, the fact that um with user error there's no room for any kind of tech stuff to stuff up there's no issues with oh this mic's playing up today or I've got a dodgy lead what am I going to do it's literally if there's a mistake it's because I've done something wrong yeah which is fine because yeah, it's probably it's momentary exactly. and it's not stuck in a looping pedal that's going to repeat <laughs> that mistake like exactly. again and again exactly. and you won't take people out of the moment. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. So on that, actually, you mentioned acoustics in terms of um, recording and or in terms mm-hmm. of listening to recordings in a different acoustic environment. So something I haven't actually touched on as part of this pod so far, which I thought would be great to land on, is acoustics and how, I mean, how, how do acoustics work? How do acoustics work? Well, <clears throat> it's a pretty broad subject. Mm. Ultimately, it's the... I'm asking you all the big questions, aren't I? I don't, uh, maybe they're <laughs> How big do questions we solve climate me. change? <laughs> <laughs> what is life? <laughs> Stop driving your car. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, life is finite. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Those questions were very we're, simple. We've sorted them. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so acoustics are the... Support or uh, how do I want to frame this? Um, the acoustics of the space is the sonic fingerprint that is left on sound created within it. Mm, love it. Yeah. So if you if you walk into a hall, the hall will support that sound in a particular way by making it, you know, kind of last for longer mm-hmm. than if you go out into the woods on a snowy day. And so, I mean, I understand how this works, but for people who don't understand, how exactly does that work? Sure. So, yeah. why is it that I go into the Immigration Museum, for example, and I sing? Amazing. I know, right? Yeah. And you sing, and it just goes on and on and on. And yet, I go into the woods and I sing, and it just stops. Yeah, it stops. Why is that? That's to do with the sound being returned to you from a place that it is sort of stopped and sent back because ultimately it's energy. You know, mm-hmm. sound is an energy. Um, and technically it converts to heat when you absorb it, but so mm. imperceptible. So in a, in a studio, say, for example, you send sound at the wall and then it bounces back off that wall if it does as a, a, a diminished version of itself in terms of um, loudness and it comes back to you uh, a little quieter. Whereas in, say, a wood, like, you know, where, where we go skiing up at Mount Hotham, if you're outside and there is snow around, the snow is, you know, going to absorb sound and so the trees are going to just break it up. They're generally not going to send it back unless there's that many of them and you're in a circle of them. Mm. But it will absorb that sound or, or it will, like, it will become converted into heat within that thing that it hits and it will it will be not returning to you with in any intensity. Whereas in, say, the Immigration Museum, you've got a lot of parallel surfaces that are a long way away. They're all highly reflected because they're painted mm. and so they become quite slappy. But because a lot of the surfaces in there are also quite irregularly shaped, it means that the sound is what we, we call dispersed or it is diffused. Mm. So it is it hits those surfaces and it breaks up and then it scatters a little more but it still is bouncing back. And so it becomes quite pleasing depending on what your definition of pleasing is Mm. um, because the sound continues. It it resonates within the space. It keeps on going. And that ultimately is the acoustic fingerprint of say the immigration museum, you Mm. said? Yeah. Yeah. And whereas Mm -hmm. like, like in here, it's a, there is some reflected energy in this room, but it's, it's lots of wood. What I'm looking at right yeah. now is lots of cool shaped wood and, yeah. Yeah, so it's all irregularly shaped wood. 
Mm. Uh, well, you know, it, it, there's a slight repeating pattern to it, but the idea is that some sound will be reflected, but some will be absorbed so that we get a balanced acoustic in here mm -hmm. so that I can accurately assess things playing back out of speakers. And I've had to learn the room because every room sounds different, but, mm -hmm. um, but the acoustic of this space is quite controlled. So there's not a long reverb tail. If you clap, it doesn't last for very long. Mm. Say you go to the, the Immigration Museum and clap and it lasts a long time. Yeah. It will continue to echo or reverberate. Mm. Once you've set that energy in motion, there's not a lot of things taking that energy out of it. So it's the size of the room. It's the what the room is comprised of yes. and the shape of the surfaces. They're the main things that sort of change yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, because you can get quite a long reverb tail out of a bathroom, as mm. anyone has will have experienced when they go into their bathroom, because you've got a lot of parallel surfaces mm. opposite one another that are highly reflective. Like, you've got tiles, tiles on the walls, uh, a, a flat roof that's you know painted in probably like ideally a bathroom paint, which <laughs> you know has some anti mold in it and is probably slightly glossy, so that the water yeah. runs off it and doesn't stick to it, and and that will cause sound to flutter around and, mm. and reverberate. Um, but then you go to the Immigration Museum and it's enormous. Mm. You're know, like, that room looks huge on your it's thing. It's huge. It's yeah. massive. And one interesting thing that I wanted to ask you as well too, so how is it then that um, the music came across beautifully, anything that I was doing musically, but the minute I talked from halfway down the room, no one could hear me further back. The words all get jumbled. That's an intelligibility thing mm. really is because – probably that room particularly was su quite supportive of speech frequencies. And I mean, too supportive of those speech frequencies mm. where it would hold them for longer and make it very hard. It kind of became clattery and noisy. Mm. Um, what's interesting about people versus microphones, just as a little tangent as well, mm. is, you know, when you go out to dinner with someone and the room's loud and noisy mm. and you initially I can't. I hate that so much. But after about. <laughs> Two or three minutes, you can hear them. You, uh, you can kind of yeah, yeah. you kind of get the sense of what they're like. Mm. It changes. Ears change. We adapt to noisy environments. We mm. will actively our brain will filter out noise. So probably part of the reason that your you know your attendees of your sound bath never really got to hear you when you were talking is because uh, potentially like you would go from playing bowls and and doing the sound bath to talking and then. No, this is right at the start. Right at and the it was beginning. even when I was setting up the the person from the Immigration Museum who was helping me, she said, FYI, once anyone passed halfway down the room's not gonna hear your words just get all jumbled up. And I could even see it with her. She was talking to me at one point and it was literally like then she came closer and I could hear her. It was quite quite incredible. Probably never Yeah, probably it's just so reflective of space. Yeah. This the the words just go blue and just turn into this just mush. Yeah, whereas like, sound like, was was fine. Yeah, well, like, as in sorry, music, music, anything musical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably because of the frequencies that we operate at. Probably just mm. speech in that space. You know, most human speech is sort of the intelligible part of it is really between, um, you know, a hundred hertz and sort of three k. Okay, about three thousand yeah. hertz. Um, you know, that's sort of like is about three k. Yeah, yeah, is about there. Um. You know, most people speak at, a, at that sort of 600 hertz. That's about where, uh, you know, most people's like the intelligible part of speech will resonate. And then, mm -hmm. you know, way down low is going to be that kind of 100-ish hertz. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. So that's where most people work. And probably that room just spoils those frequencies. Mm -hmm. And by spoils, I mean it over supports it. Mm -hmm. And so they become quite well supported it'll be a dimensional thing it'll be like the fact that the room is this wide this high this mm. long and has these surfaces they just all come together do not quite work there whereas your singing bowls i i found they tended to be quite like they have a lot of fundamental frequency that's quite low mm. fundamental is the lowest frequency that, that a thing can create mm. so its fundamental frequency will be quite low and that probably just doesn't excite the room too much in in a way that's over-represented. Yeah, got it. Yeah. It, it would cool. be interesting to take a test microphone in there and mm. like, you know, do a, fil a, a sign sweep, which is where you put out a very simple tone into the room that goes from 
as low as it can to as high as you mm. want. So it usually goes from like 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz because that's the range of human hearing. That's pretty much, I did that in episode two, <clears throat> episode yep. one or two, I actually did that. So yeah. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> and so if you did that in the space, it would be interesting to capture it at different distances to see what yeah. happens to the room yeah. as you go further away as to like where its problem areas are. And then if they really wanted to, they could treat that room acoustically so that you wouldn't spoil its character, but you might just amend some of the things that make it hard to be used for certain things or you'd have you know portable acoustic items that you could use that would allow you to to correct and I, I use inverted commas again you know correct the room so that it would be more multi-purpose yeah cool you could do that with it so actually on that reverb I was thinking about this this morning on the way um why, I mean, why is it that we love, I mean, if you put a vocal out that's just dry and it has no reverb on it, no mm. one's going to buy that. It'll, I mean, you're, you're probably going, oh, no. I, can I love, I that. do love that. And I, I love it at certain times for certain things. But, but people do. Why is it that there's this obsession? I mean, I've got a, a theory around it, but I'd love to hear your idea. What is this? Why do people love that, that sound, that sound of like a long reverb? And, and Okay. So I think it depends on what it's going with and when. You know, everything is in relation to something else. Mm. Like like we were saying before, you know, sound has no no future, only a past. Mm. Is that with with a reverb, it softens things. That is an ab like for sure. It also helps with pitch. Mm. So by having sound coming back to you later, as well as you know, short term later, what happens is you're getting some of that old pitch information happening again and it's blending with the currently occurring pitch information and so that will create a slight chorusing effect which will make the maybe out of tune bits of the vocal because they're never perfect and you don't Mm. really want them to be um it will help soften those sort of harsher edges of sound that's one thing that it Mm. could do it also can give an emotional space to something and help Mm. to inform the emotional impact that a, a, a vocal or a a guitar part or a piano concerto is designed to impart upon a listener. So a long, re- a really, really, really long reverb puts you in a space. And so if you're singing about loneliness, you know, mm. if, if that's what the song is about, then a long reverb will help to support that idea because it will enhance the the visualization of where that story is coming from. Mm. And so you can actively place it somewhere. But I think it's it's multifactorial. It's not just one thing that is solved. It's you know, it's a pretty crude hammer if you just use it to like fix pitch because it's oh. better to get this, someone to sing properly. That is true. Well, yeah, it was something that I was wondering and I've always wondered and then someone brought it up um, mm. with me last week was around the whole idea that, you know, we um, as primitive man were in caves. And there's yeah. that natural, so is there that evolutionary um, connection to the sound of, you know, this big reverb? And then, of course, you know, many years of many people going through churches and actually that being the community hub and all this sort of stuff. So we've got all this past history of being in these, uh, you know, spaces with with beautiful reverberation. Well, also, uh, yes, and then to further that, you asked me at the start of this, do you want to wear headphones? And I was like, oh, no, actually, maybe I should because then I can hear what I'm doing. Mm. And part of the reverb as the creator of the sound is to hear some feedback, to hear what you're doing. Mm. And and as soon as you take away all the reverb, if you – because I can kind of hear myself in this room. It, you know, it, it I am hearing myself back. And so that's allowing me to adjust what I'm doing and change yeah. some things about my sound so that I don't – overdo it or come across too nasally or whatever it is. Mm. And as a, a speaker in, in a space, say a cave or in a church, mm. you know, I think part of the reason church acoustics work so well is because they help to um, support the idea of like a deity on high, in mm. a, in a, you know, in a cloud-based scenario. That's where, true. You know, like I, I, think, I think it helps fit that image really well, <laughs> definitely. You know, when the angels sang and it sounded that like... True. <laughs> you know, I, th- I think it. I think that helped. It definitely. It was definitely part of the marketing. Um, uh, but um, with with listening to yourself, it can feel quite lonely to speak and not have reverb. Mm. It can. It, I think that it. It would. You know, to stand on top of a hill, 
far enough up that when you do, I, it's kind of if it's not windy, I think it's going to be quite dead in terms of the the reverberance of that space. It's going to be really, really dead. Mm. It's not going to come back at you f- from another mountain for kilometers. Mm. At which point it's going to be so quiet anyway, mm. you won't hear it. But um, yeah, you you would want some kind of feedback. Otherwise, you'll feel really lonely. So reverb is its connection. It's like this false little person coming back. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's all we want as humans. We just want connection. Well, I mean, some people are pretty happy being on their like, own. But it's like an ear cuddle. An e- <laughs> yeah. I'm going to call that the name of the podcast episode, Ear Cuddle. Reverb <laughs> is an ear cuddle. I love it. It's yeah. beautiful. I love it. So actually on that actually um, – Links me on to one of the final questions. We'll have to probably wrap up so I could talk to you forever. But um, so you also have a child, Poppy, yep, who's the same age as my Stells. Um, and um, what about her? Like her interactions with sound. Have you? Is there anything cool that you've seen where you know being a young child and stuff, and just the how children in, experience sound and yeah. vibration? Yeah, it's and it's, it's it's come in different stages across time as well. Like it's been really interesting to watch things change. Like last weekend she decided she wanted to learn to play piano hmm. and and she asked me to write out Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star in, on sh- as sheet music. She wanted it written that way because she'd been trying, you know, a few months ago to try and write stuff. You know, she's just writing like, you know, semi-quavers and quavers and stuff hmm. like that, just in random orders. Um, and she fluked writing the rhythm for Jingle Bells. And, like Brilliant. She, she'd just written this thing. She's like, Daddy, what is that? And I was looking at it I was like, well, I mean, apart from the fact that you haven't got bar lines, it's kind of jingle bells. <laughs> Further to that, she's making up, you know, gibberish lyrics when she just sits at the bench to eat her breakfast. So that's happening. And then on top of that, she's quite reactive to input of music being converted for her as dance. So because she mm. does ballet and, you know, loves it really really gets into it but she also loves pop music she's dancing a lot and it's kind of it's a double-edged sword because i love seeing her do it but also it means that dinner grinds to a halt when like a certain song comes on yeah. on the stereo oh, yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it, the the struggle is real. Mm. We have dance olds. breaks during dinner. Oh my god, <laughs> dance break, mum! <laughs> All I want is you to eat your sausage and go to bed <laughs> right now, because tomorrow will be hell if you don't. <sighs> but um, but it's also really cute because mm. they have a great time doing it, and they so do. she will spend, you know, time dancing in response to something that's coming to her as mm. like as music and. Not everything gets danced to, just certain things. Mm. You know, like not everything moves her. Um, quite literally, it compels her to movement. It's mm. so cool to see someone just be like, oh, okay, I've got to do it. I've got to do it, yeah. That's <laughs> it's it. so cool. <laughs> um, so there's that. But then also she, like like Stella, has a synthesizer that she likes to play. And mm. I think I think you saw that on my Instagram I of her did. like – doing a backyard DJ sesh. Mm. And that was probably the worst, like not the, not the best bit of it. You know, I, I experienced the best bit and then I took a video of like what continued on. But she like had one hand in the air at one point. <laughs> she like, she thought she was making a proper set. She was playing music for my wife That's and I while amazing. we were doing the planting of the garden because she'd lost interest in that at, the, at that point. But it was, yeah, that's that's her experience at the moment is it's reactive and, and converts into dance. So she's seeing... The, the full communication of music as being something that is internalised and then expressed again because often with music it is, you know, that that uh, it's the communication of an idea to someone but then also the reciprocation of that idea mm. back, you know, so she she reflects it to the, the person that mm. gave it to them effectively even if they're not there. The energy is passed on and she's then putting it out in another way. Yeah, totally. Yeah, which is therefore impacting you guys. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, either – very positively or sometimes like sit down and eat your dinner <laughs> <laughs> at the end of this song we're gonna we're gonna go back to tea you know yeah. i love it well i think that pretty much sums it up thank you so so much i pleasure. pretty much um one thing i did want to ask you is, yeah. is there anything you've got coming up or anything that you want to promote other than the studio or anything or is there anything uh, that you've got coming there's up some wanna... really cool artists that I've been working with, one of them is Black Dime Cabaret. They're like a, a five-piece um, kind of it's, – it's cabaret music, but it's, mm. you know, very, very 
klezmer gypsy kind of stuff oh, as cool. well. It's really fun. Yeah. Crazy time signatures, swaps and changes, but it's, you know, uh, highly theatrized as well. It's it's exciting music. There's that. Um, this week's going to be fun. There's a, a mixed thing that I'm doing. My, my godfather and the singer in my band is leaving at the end of next week, mm. which is a bit of a bummer because he's mm. going overseas. So we're finishing up making the rest of our Melody Jones records. That'll be fun. And so mm. then we'll put some stuff out. Yeah. So, yeah, Melody Jones is the thing that we do. Yeah. Although we, we mostly, you know, eat pizza and fried chicken instead <laughs> of actually making music. We, it's, you know, my my chicken, you know, club loves to make music. It's that kind That's of thing. That's unreal. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't put a lot out. We have a lot of fun though. That's yeah. good. That, so that's that's definitely in the works. And if anyone wants to record here at Ginger, they can just reach out to you like you're open to complete noobs coming Anybody. in, getting in touch and saying, yeah. I want to make something. Can yeah. you record me yeah. playing the harmonica? And Yeah, you know, totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I had a guy who did that reached out last week, and he we were in the studio pretty quickly to do a guitar vocal thing that he'd done. He'd written four songs and was like, "I just want to record these." We did amazing, them. and I'm not discriminatory about like how good or bad you must be before you can come in. If it's like a a friend of mine who runs a very successful cafe in Melbourne says like, if you can order it and pay for it, you can have it. Yeah, there and you go. I think that's fair. There you go. That's like that should just be like your byline on your website. If you can order, if you can, if you can sing it and pay for it, if you can play it and pay for it, you can come. You can come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I won't judge. I won't judge. Um, Thanks, baby. Thank you so much, Jimmy. So as always, um, I always like to pick a um, particular charity. So. I my whole model with this podcast is sharing information, mm-hmm. getting it out there, um, giving people a resource, and um, not seeking financial gain from it. So mm-hmm. rather than doing, you know, a Patreon or something like that, I always at the end of each episode direct people to a particular charity. So is there any particular charity that you would like today to sort of? You I know? was stuck when you asked me about this, looking at sort of two of them. One of them is, you know, fairly topical at the moment, but it's not going to like the actual event for it's not going to happen for quite a while. And that's, mm. you know, um, uh, Movember. Like if you have a friend that gets into Movember and, and, and does that, then please support that person. Yeah, but at yeah. the moment, um, I think Lifeline's a really good one to, to yeah. keep, keep supporting because they, they solve so many people's problems and it you know like they're a first line of call and i think that's really important that we save people from oftentimes doing things that are really quite unspeakable and unhorrible things yeah so yeah lifeline would be the one that i would ask people to go and check out amazing thank you so much and thank you so much for your generosity having me here today my two different types of water (laughs) (laughs) and for allowing me to be in this gorgeous studio and um yeah hopefully we get to do some more fun stuff I look forward to it, baby. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. I hope you enjoyed that chat with a very entertaining and interesting person, Mr. James Lloyd Wyatt. And I'm pretty sure I'll be referring to reverb as ear cuddles from this moment forward. (laughs) Please join me next week when we chat to one of my favourite human beings who has a completely different take on the whole idea of sound and connection to culture and spirit as well. It's a really wonderful chat and I look forward to sharing it with you. If you enjoyed this week's episode, I encourage you to follow it, like it and share it with your friends and family. Meanwhile, keep your ears and hearts open.